Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Lori Kaplan. I'm chair of the Ashton Climate Action Project, which is an initiative of Southern Oregon Climate Action Now, which is the leading organization here in Southern Oregon uh, working on climate issues, um, a really important voice for science um, and uh, amazing advocates uh, working on statewide issues and here locally in Southern Oregon. So I'm very proud to be associated with SOCAN and our, um, our co-facilitators of SOCAN, Kathy Conway and Alan Jernay are here as well. So that's fantastic. This program is being recorded. Um, so we will make the recording available later. Um, after, as soon as it's ready, I will push it out to you and you can share it with one and all. Um, and then we will be putting it up on the SOCAN YouTube site um, within a few days, but we'll, we'll have it up on the Zoom site uh, first for a few days. Uh, before I get started, I want to uh, do our land acknowledgement um, and mention that this program is being held in the ancestral lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and other native peoples. We are grateful to the elders and their people who cared for these lands. We acknowledge that native people still live here and we honor their sovereignty. We are thankful for these lands and the people, the plants and animals that inhabit them. And as I think you know, the Ashland Climate Action Project is a volunteer driven, uh, highly passionate, um, very busy volunteer organization here in Ashland that's working to ensure that climate action is a top priority here in Ashland. Um, and you, you may know, I think you know, that uh, in 2017, we passed the Climate Energy Action Plan, uh, which is being implemented. And we just, we follow that and we see how the community can support and be involved in that. Um, and I really encourage you to um, do whatever you can to, to um, step up and get involved. We're launching some big campaigns coming up on focused on natural gas and on transportation. Uh, so we're moving much more to the action mode um, in recent months, and you'll just be, you'll be hearing a lot more about that. So we're very, very excited. Um, I also want to thank our sponsor for this evening, uh, which is RockPAC, the Rural Oregon Climate Political Action Committee. So thank you, RockPAC, for your sponsorship. And now, without any further ado, I think we can, um, well, I want to mention this is really important. Uh, this evening, my husband, Bob Kaplan, <laughs> is here uh, next to me. Um, he helps me out in so many ways, and I hope it, I hope it goes both ways. Uh, but Bob is going to be very tangibly helping me this evening by moderating the questions in the chat. So if you, um, I think probably you all are, you know the drill at this point that you have a little uh, chat icon on the bottom of your screen. Uh, that you can type into the chat, say hello to your friends. You can pop questions in there whenever they come to you. And Bob will be keeping track of those. And um, when uh, Susan Jane is finished with her presentation, um, he will be moderating those questions. Um, we did have about 90 people registered tonight. Uh, we never get quite as many as who register, but we should have a, a, a pretty good attendance tonight. So Bob's going to be a, a big help. And you can see that we kind of sit in the same room. So it's kind of funny. It'll kind of mess with your mind a little bit. So uh, we can see us on each other's screen. So just a little entertainment for you there. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Our program is called Collaborative Conservation, What Successful Forest Restoration Can Teach Us About Climate Action. And I would, uh, our speaker is Susan Jane Brown. Susan Jane is a staff attorney with the Western Environmental Law Center. Her primary focus is litigation her primary focus of litigation is federal public lands forest management, but her practice includes cases involving the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the National Forest Management Act, and other land management statutes. She is a former co-chair of the National Advisory Committee for Implementation of the National Forest System Land Management Planning Rule and is also heavily engaged in collaborative forest restoration in the Upper John Day Basin in Eastern Oregon. So Susan will go through her presentation. Uh, just relax and enjoy. We're not gonna uh, hit you with PowerPoint tonight. It's gonna be more of a, of a conversation, which I think at the end of the day, we often appreciate that. Um, so 
without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Susan. I mean, you can put your screen on speaker view so you'll really see Susan. Um, and we're, we're up against some pretty stiff competition tonight. I understand this was NFL opening night, which Susan Jane told me about. I didn't even know that shows how out of it I am. Um, but also uh, she's working on a really important project right now that she couldn't have predicted. Uh, so Susan Jane, I'm so glad that you're here with us and that you didn't bump us for a uh, federal reconciliation bill today. Thanks a lot. Take yes. it away. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to come and talk to you tonight. Um, I am Susan Jane Brown. I'm a staff attorney in the Wildlands Program Director for the Western Environmental Law Center. Um, I'm coming from you today uh, from Portland, Oregon, between the Willamette and Columbia Rivers. And I'm grateful to be on the traditional lands stewarded by the Cowlitz, Clackamas people and the Confederated Tribes, the Grand Ronde and Siletz Indians. So thank you. I want to talk to you a little bit today about my experience with collaborative conservation, particularly working with the Blue Mountains Forest Partners, which is a collaborative group based in Eastern Oregon and John Day. I want to talk to you a little bit first, though, about who I am and what I do, so you can kind of get a sense for the context in which this story arises. I'll tell you a little bit about the success of the organization, how we formed, what we're all about, and what some of that work might be able to teach us about climate action in Southern Oregon, in Oregon more broadly and uh, worldwide. So uh, just a little bit of a brief overview of my resume to kind of give you a sense of where I've been. I went to Vanderbilt University as an undergraduate student. I was a triple major in English, philosophy and political science. So no hard sciences. Um, and basically what you do with a degree like that is you go to law school. <laughs> and I went to Lewis and Clark Law School um, uh, here in Portland. I graduated in 2000 and I did come to Oregon specifically to go to law school to practice environmental law. Lewis and Clark has the number one environmental law school in the country. And so it was definitely top on my list given what I wanted to practice. I've been a staff attorney at the Western Environmental Law Center since 2009, and I have three basic buckets of work. Um, first, litigation. So I am a practicing attorney. I argue cases in federal court. I represent conservation organizations. So everyone from the Sierra Club to Klamasiskiw Wildland Center. I represent tribes. I've represented uh, scientists and individuals as well. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about my litigation work if uh, we want to. The second bucket of my work is policy work. So I work with colleagues who are influencing federal policy in Washington, D.C. And I also work with colleagues here in Oregon to influence uh, state level policy. So, for example, um, over the past year and actually the past couple of years, uh, I've worked with colleagues, uh, including Representative Pam Marsh and Senator Jeff Golden on the wildfire bill that just passed uh, in this session. Um, that is a great piece of legislation. Um, it took a lot of effort on the part of a lot of people to make that happen. And hopefully uh, we're going to see some real benefits, particularly in Southern Oregon. So that's some of my policy uh, type work. And I do the same kinds of things on the federal level uh, involving federal legislation, federal funding, that sort of thing. And then the third bucket of my work at WELC is my collaborative work, which I'm gonna talk about um, uh, tonight. Before coming to the Western Environmental Law Center, I was a natural resources counsel for Congressman Peter DeFazio. I think all of you know Congressman DeFazio. Um, I was his natural resources counsel. And so I worked on um, public lands issues, uh, agriculture issues, uh, Native American affairs issues. Um, if it had feathers or wings or swam or flew, it was an issue that I handled for the congressman. I did all kinds of things for him. I wrote legislation. Uh, I prepared him for briefings. I uh, answered constituent mail. So if you've ever written Congressman DeFazio, um, Congressional staff actually read every individual letter and draft a response. So I did that kind of work as well for the congressman, which really um, uh, exposed me to all kinds of interesting procedural things about how a bill really becomes a law. Um, not what I learned in college, even though I was a poli sci major, 
um, I, I was I was amazed at how a bill actually becomes a law. And I, I learned that working for Congressman DeFazio. Prior to going to Capitol Hill to work for the congressman, I was a clinical professor of law at Lewis and Clark Law School, which is where I, I did go to law school. I, was, uh, I worked as a staff attorney at the Environmental Law Clinic. So uh, that functions as a law firm as well, representing clients, environmental groups in, in federal court. And I also taught at the law school at the same time. Uh, I taught forest law and policy, which I still teach today. And that's the area of expertise that I've developed. And I, I enjoy teaching at the law school, giving back to the community uh, for starters but also helping to influence the next generation of uh, lawyers and em environmental attorneys. So I, I still teach forest law and policy at the law school today. Prior to going to uh, the law school or returning to the law school, I was executive director of a small forest protection uh, nonprofit organization called the Gifford Pinchot Task Force. Uh, it's now known as the Cascade Forest Conservancy, and they work to protect the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Southwest Washington. So as executive director, I did everything from fundraise to write letters to the Forest Service. Um, I was litigating at the time also, so I was in-house counsel. So I was, I was a bit of a, a Jane of all hats, if you will. I was doing a lot of different things as executive director. But that work, um, I, I give you sort of a little bit of my background so you get a sense of the different things that I've done in my past. And I, I tend to kind of glom on to the things that I've liked to do in the past. And those, the, the best parts of the things I've done in the past are the things that I am lucky enough to be able to do today uh, working for the Western Environmental Law Center. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, some of that work. Um, and I want to talk about my, about my work with the Blue Mountains Forest Partners. Um, this is a collaborative group uh, that works to restore large landscapes on the Malheur National Forest in eastern Oregon. So on the eastern side of the Cascades, dry ponderosa pine forests, frequent fire forests, um, even more fire than, than what you guys are seeing right now, they experience or historically uh, traditionally did on the east side. But things are a little bit different. Uh, we don't have as many listed species on the east side. So we don't have the spotted owl, for example. And that can make things a little bit different when you're talking about forest management. But let's talk a little bit about how I even came to be out in John Day, Oregon. I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm a liberal environmental attorney, female woman, uh, attorney, and um, that's not your usual constituent in Eastern Oregon. So I want to talk a little bit about how I found myself in Eastern Oregon. And it starts with litigation. Um, as I said before, I, uh, when I was at Lewis and Clark Law School working for the Environmental Law Clinic and teaching, I was representing clients and I represented a number of conservation organizations who challenged uh, timber sales on the Malheur National Forest, particularly timber sales that were proposed in recently burned forests. So these are post-fire salvage sales. I think some of you are familiar with that practice. We see a lot of it um, after wildfires on, on public lands and on private lands. And uh, my clients uh, didn't wanna see that type of activity occur. And so we challenged a number of post-fire salvage sales on the Malheur. And we were successful in that litigation. So we won our cases. That meant that the logging stopped and didn't occur. And what that meant by extension was that as the Forest Service was preparing post-fire salvage sales, they weren't preparing restoration sales or they weren't preparing timber sales in unburned forests. So they didn't have a pipeline of timber that they could go and log if a court happened to shut down their salvage program. And that's what happened. So the Forest Service was focused on chasing salvage sales. Uh, and in the meantime, hadn't been preparing any green sales. So when salvage stopped, they didn't have anything to log. And we're talking about Eastern Oregon, John Day. Um, 
there are two main, actually three main sources of income if you live in Grant County, logging, ranching, and working for the Forest Service. And so when the timber sale program dried up because there weren't any more timber sales because of the court injunctions, that was a real problem for that community. Now for my clients, it was fine <laughs> because we didn't want those timber sales to go forward. And so we were successful in our objective. But what was happening as a result of that was some pretty severe economic distress for the local communities that were dependent on, on that timber. So that was sort of going on in the background. I find myself at a Forest Service uh, planning meeting. I know many of you have been to those sorts of open houses that the Forest Service or the BLM puts together for a timber sale or whatever project they wanna do. Um, and I was at one of those. And I was approached at a break by a gentleman with a very large cowboy hat and a very equally sized handlebar mustache, which is quite the thing. Um, I, I live in Portland, the, the home of fancy mustaches, but the sight of a man in a cowboy hat with a very large handlebar mustache was something that took me a little bit aback. But he walked right up to me and he said, my name's Boyd Britton. I'm a county commissioner in Grant County and your litigation is shutting us down and that's not working for me or my community. And I wanna invite you out there. I want you to come out to see my community. I wanna take you out to the forest and I'll bring you back, but I wanna take you out there so you can see what this litigation is, is doing to my community and to the forest that we depend on. And he was that blunt with me, <laughs> which is pretty blunt. Um, even, you know, I'm a lawyer and I say blunt things all the time, but that was, that was pretty blunt, pretty surprising. And I took Boyd up on his offer. I said, sure, I'll listen to anybody once. I'll talk to anybody who wants to have a conversation about things. And so I traveled to Grant County from Portland and I spent three days out in the field with Boyd and many of his compatriots in the timber industry, um, in the ranching industry, others who were in business in the community who were affected by the downturn in the logging that had been happening, which by the way was um, coming at a time where timber harvest had already been declining on federal lands for, for decades. So this is part of a larger systemic change in the timber industry and in the socioeconomic setting of Oregon writ large and the West even larger than that. So these are not unusual complaints and concerns. I know that you hear this in Southern Oregon. I hear it as well. <laughs> um, and so none of this is unusual, right? But I took Boyd up on his offer and we spent three days out in the field talking about what I saw when I looked at the forest and what he saw and what his compatriots saw. And we talked about what we wanted from the forest. And we talked about the role of, of humans in the forest, um, both historically, previously, um, both traditional um, and indigenous. And we talked about a lot of things. Um, and we disagreed about pretty much everything we talked about. We couldn't agree on what a healthy forest was or what sustainable development was, or what a healthy community was, or how many board feet should be coming off the forest, or how many pileated woodpeckers or snags there should be on the forest. So we couldn't agree on pretty much anything. The only thing that we could agree on at the end of the day was that we cared a lot about the forest. For whatever reason, we cared a lot. Um, to the point where big burly logger guys get teary-eyed when they start talking about it because they care so much. And it's obvious that they care um, for whatever reason. So out of all of that, all we could conclude was that we at least cared. And that was enough. That was enough for Boyd and I to decide that it was worth having a second conversation. And those conversations grew over time. And I wanna talk a little bit about Blue Mountain Forest Partners forming, storming, norming, and performing phases. 
And these are phases of organizational development that you hear a lot. Um, and it rings really true for me and, and this particular work. And I wanna talk a little bit about why we've been successful in that effort. So the forming stage, this is the stage when the team meets and learns about the opportunities and challenges, and then agrees on goals and begins to tackle the tasks, right? So that's sort of the broad description of the forming stage. And for us, that stage took years. It took probably three or four years for us to form. And, and you can see why. You put lawyers, environmentalists, ranchers, loggers, and the land management agency, so you throw the Forest Service into the mix, in a room together. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, and all of those things went wrong. All of those things went wrong. There was so much baggage. Um, Everyone was angry, everyone was hurt, no one felt heard or understood. Um, they, everyone thought they knew absolutely everything about everything and everyone, why, they, why someone was in the room, what they cared about, where they came from, why they were in the room, that they were paid to be there, that they just wanted to clear cut everything. Like everyone had it all figured out, right? We knew everything about all of the things. Um, and at that point, again, very little common ground. The only thing that we could agree on was that we loved the forest. Some of us wanted it horizontal, some of us wanted it vertical, but we loved the forest and that was enough reason to keep coming back to the table. The other thing that we could agree on was that we didn't trust the forest service, which is pretty interesting. So, and I, I do kind of feel badly for my forest service partners um, because nobody liked them at all. No one trusted them. No one liked anything they had to say. No one believed them. And so the agency was really in the middle, which is an interesting place to be. But at this point, we did start to begin the important relationship repair work. And that's what really needed to start to happen. We needed to vent. I mean, this is, this is therapy. <laughs> it's, it's full contact therapy. Everyone needed to vent and to get everything out there about how they felt, even though many of us don't talk about our feelings, um, we talk about what's right and what's true and what we know, but you can substitute those words for I feel or I care or I think, <laughs> and you get to the same place, right? And so we started to begin that important repair work. The next phase, the storming phase, which is when the group sort of starts to sort itself out and gain each other's trust. So the T word, the trust word, that's the word that is really important and is kind of the secret sauce. And for us, for the Blue Mountains Forest Partners, this phase also took years. But the trust building part was key. And we did it in a couple of ways. First was science. One of the things that I said at the very beginning in order to get me as an environmentalist and as a lawyer to the table was we were gonna follow the best available science. We were gonna follow the science. Whatever our experts told us was going on and what the best thing to do was, that's what we were going to do. We weren't going to talk about how our granddaddy did it or how, you know, if we just let every acre be grazed, it would be better. We're not going to, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and, and because nobody trusts the Forest Service, we're going to get some third party scientists involved that we all agree on, we respect and we trust and believe will tell us the right thing to do. Which again, thinking about our poor forest service partners is really hard, right? Because they're told that they're the experts and they are the deciders and the land managers. So now you're telling them that they can't really do what they think their job is, which is really hard to hear. Um, but also we managed to, the, it, it wasn't necessarily that the forest service was saying something different than what our third party scientists were saying but we couldn't hear it when it was coming from the agency because again everybody's got baggage with the agency and it's baggage with the agency by the way it's not actually individuals because as we know individuals in the agency come and go on a pretty regular basis right but we stay we're here this is our place we stay and so it's always the agency and it's hard to trust an agency, you can trust people, but you can't trust an agency, particularly if the agency is always changing on you, right? And so the Forest Service, I feel bad for them because they're in a tough spot. We kind of sideline them, I'll be honest. 
we sidelined the agency because we didn't trust them. But once we got our third party scientists involved, who we did trust, and the Forest Service could kind of sit back and let those folks lead as trusted messengers, the Forest Service could just kind of sit back and nod. Yep, that's right. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> because we could hear it from the scientists, we couldn't hear it from the agency. And that was true for all the stakeholders. So also kind of an interesting situation there, right? So we brought scientists, third-party scientists to the table, and that was really key for us. The other thing that we did was we got out in the field together. And I know you guys do this a lot too. Getting out into the woods to talk about trees is essential. There is no substitute for that. And so by getting out there in the forest with our scientists and with the agency and talking about what we saw and what we wanted, we got very specific about which trees to cut and why and why not. And that really helped all of us get away from what I think we all tend to do. And I certainly tend to do as an environmental attorney. I sit in front of my computer a lot and I read a lot of EAs and environmental impact statements. Um, what is on the page is not always what's in the field, right? You got to get out in the field. You got to understand what's really going out there. And you got to hear the perspectives of other people when you're looking at the same thing. So you can really start to understand each other. And at this point, we were also starting to develop our own shared language about how we talk about things and what we mean when we say certain things. So we developed our own shared vocabulary, which I will also acknowledge is pretty nerdy and can be difficult to break into. It is a bit of a shared language and it takes some translation for new folks when you're bringing them on. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the third thing that was super important for us um, is food and drink. Um, John Day, Oregon is a very far way from Portland, Oregon. It takes five hours to drive one way. And so if I was coming over for a field trip, I wasn't just coming over for a field trip. I was gonna have to spend at least two days there and at least one night there. And as our group started to grow, I was bringing colleagues from the west side of the Cascades over to the east side to talk a little bit more about whether this collaborative thing made sense. So that you had a lot of people coming from the west side to the east side, sharing our views, but also sharing our money. <laughs> but we needed a place to eat at the end of the day. And John Day is a very small town and there is one place to go if you wanna eat and drink in town. So everybody shows up there. The foresters shows up there, the enviros show up there, the loggers show up there, the ranchers are there, everybody's there. And it's not a big place. And so you kind of got to share your space. This is pre-COVID, of course. Uh, and sitting down in a booth with somebody sharing a pitcher of beer over a pizza starts to break down barriers. Because you're talking about, well, I like pepperoni on my pizza. I don't like pineapple. It's like, oh, I don't like pineapple either. That's weird. And suddenly, you may not agree on which tree to gut, cut, but you can agree on which pizza to order. So that's something. And you start to break down those barriers and you start to see people as people and not as caricatures or positions. They're actual people with views and thoughts and concerns and hopes. And so over food and drink, you actually start to really humanize the other. And that helps to move the dialogue forward as well. The norming phase, resolve disagreements and personality clashes result in greater intimacy and a spirit of cooperation emerges. This is the fun stuff. This is when you realize that you're stronger together than apart. And you may not necessarily agree on everything, but you're starting to agree on more and more. And the stuff that you can agree on is actually pretty cool and it's actionable stuff. We can work on things together. We can work together with the Forest Service, and we can propose in a competitive process to receive a 10-year slug of money from Congress to implement a large landscape restoration project on the Malheur National Forest. 
And I know folks in Ashland have recently done the same thing. That's pretty cool when you're bringing in money to do stuff that people agree on that helps the forest be healthy and helps your community survive. That's pretty rad. And then that shifts into performing. With group norms and roles established, group members focus on achieving common goals, often reaching an unexpectedly high level of success. Not without controversy and conflict, of course. Uh, we had just gotten going and in 2012, uh, the owner of the mill in town, there was only one mill left um, called Malheur Lumber Company. It was one mill left in Grant County. They announced that they were gonna have to close their doors because they didn't have a sustainable supply of raw material. The Forest Service wasn't planning timber sales fast enough. Our collaborative work wasn't advancing at a quick enough pace to develop projects that had widespread agreement and were based on the best available science. So the mill was gonna close. That's a problem. If, if you believe in restoration, that wood has to go somewhere. That small diameter wood has to go somewhere. And if you can process it and add value to it, that actually makes a profit. And until things change, we're in a capitalist society and we run on making a profit, right? So the mill needed to make money to keep people employed in that community. If the mill closed, half of the community at least would close. They would pack up and leave. And so the mill announced it was gonna close in 2012. And we all came together, the Blue Mountains Forest Partners came together with our Forest Service partners, with Senators Merkley and Wyden, and we put together a plan. We were gonna save the mill, the Forest Service was gonna double down and invest in forest restoration on the Malheur, and in fact, in Region 6, in Oregon and Washington, they were gonna push more money out into the field to support collaborative restoration efforts like this one. So the Forest Service was gonna do its part. The senators managed to go find some money in the couch cushions and send it the Forest Service's way to support the increased need for planning and implementation and restoration and monitoring. The collaborative group doubled down. We got to work. We worked hard on a number of projects. The Forest Service worked really hard. They worked overtime. And the timber industry went to their partners. So our industry folks in Grant County went to their partners in the larger industry and said, we've got something cool going on here and we need you to support it. So you folks over on the West side, stop complaining <laughs> about what we're doing over here on the East side and support our work, right? And we kept the mill open, mills open today. They're doing some amazing work. They've actually expanded some of their um, facility to use more of the tree. So they use um, bark and shaving for animal shaving, for animal bedding. Um, they have a, a device that compresses sawdust into briquettes that can be burned at a, a low emission, high heat um, oven. Um, they also have a post and pole facility. So if you're building fence out in Eastern Oregon, you need, you know, poles and fencing material, they provide that now. Um, and they also have a few, uh, firewood, um, business. So they, they bundle firewood for, for campers. So using more aspects of the byproducts of our restoration work. So everybody has really chipped in to make this happen. And that's performing, right? That's performing. It's still difficult, I'm not gonna lie. It's hard. We have challenges all the time. We have people that don't support this work on both sides. So the right flank and the left flank, a lot of folks don't like what we're doing, but that's okay. We think it's the right thing. So we're gonna keep at it. So how does this experience relate to SOCAN's work? I, I think there's a couple of takeaway messages here. First, the big picture, um, taking action on any issue. And I've been talking to you about forest restoration, which I know some of you are, are involved in as well, but that's climate action, that's social justice, that's anything. So taking action on any issue requires the right people at the right time in the right place for the right reasons. 
I got really lucky at the time that Blue Mountains Forest Partners started. Had Boyd Britton not approached me at that Forest Service meeting, we wouldn't be here today. We got lucky and we had the right people involved. Even though these are a bunch of loggers from Eastern Oregon who are very conservative, very different than I am, they are good people. They are good people. We don't vote the same way, <laughs> um, but they're good people. And we can agree on how to restore that forest and how to keep that community safe and, and prosperous. So you need people who can hear and listen to others, even if imperfectly. So we don't always get it right, but at least folks that have that inclination to be able to listen to others and to, to hear what they're saying. Um, this is also known as emotional intelligence. So folks that have that, even if they don't know what that is or what that's called, people that can listen. And it doesn't, again, require agreement initially or even at the end of the day, but it does require empathy um, and the ability to run a marathon in the other person's shoes. You really gotta be able to understand where people are coming from, even if you don't agree with them. And you don't even have to accept it. It doesn't even have to make sense to you. <laughs> but you do have to at least understand where they're coming from. And I think that's important. External factors also help. Um, a third party facilitator, we had one for the first probably seven or eight years. A third party neutral facilitator is really key. Someone who does not have a dog in the fight and can run shuttle diplomacy is really helpful. And we had that in our early days and it, it was really essential. Science support, I talked a lot about that. Um, and this is an issue that I think SOCAN probably deals with um, a fair amount. You know, in Eastern Oregon, there isn't universal agreement that climate change is a thing, <laughs> um, that we humans are causing it, and that people can and should take steps to fix it. So how do you work with people like that um, who don't accept the same fundamental principles as you do? And the answer to that is you find something <laughs> that you can agree on and you start there. You start there and you see where it takes you. Um, figures of authority, scientists, farmers, um, others who speak uh, truth to their people um, and those who respect them, you know, figures of authority can be really helpful um, to helping kind of bridge that divide or to translate between folks that, that may not be coming at an issue from the same place. So with Blue Mountains Forest Partners, we don't all agree <laughs> on anthropogenic climate change, but we do all agree for sure that the fire season is getting longer, consuming more forest and threatening communities. And that's enough for us to work together, right? We can focus on the stuff that we can agree on. We don't necessarily have to agree on all of the things. The other thing is it takes time, um, which is a challenge given that we don't really have time when it comes to climate action and climate change. We don't have the luxury of time. And so that is a real challenge. But I think focusing on, and I think we're starting finally, unfortunately, I, I think to see with the fire seasons we've been having, I think folks are starting to finally grapple with the fact that the climate is different. <laughs> the climate is different. And we need to to respond differently to that. So I think um, hopefully some of that um, need for change will be coming sooner rather than later. But at the end of the day, it's still about interpersonal relationships and it takes time to build those types of relationships suitable for collective action. But you've got to start somewhere and you never know where it's going to take you. Um, so I will stop there and uh, take questions and really look forward to the conversation. Again, thank you so much for um, joining tonight. I really appreciate it and for choosing me over football. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Susan Jane. Um, I guess I want to leave over the question. Oh, sorry, just um, my husband and I are working things out here. Um, so, um, when you say that it took years, like what, um, I, I just am impressed by the level of commitment uh, that you all had and the fortitude to stick with it. So I would, um, when, when you say it took years, like how many, what was many? that? 
So um, we first started in 2003. And so I've been working out there however many years that is, <laughs> a lot, <laughs> more than I care to count. Um, and, you know, the first couple of years, the first two or three years were super rocky and really bumpy. And the reason why people stayed at the table and, and folks did come and go from the table, but the reason why people came back to the table or stayed um, was because we didn't have any alternative. From the community's perspective, they, they were done without a sustainable timber sale program. And they were smart enough to realize that the environmental community held the keys to that. And they had the humility to, to recognize it and to be like, all right, these people are controlling my destiny. We better go talk to them <laughs> because litigation isn't working. So we better go try something else. So for the community, they were kind of, they were desperate. They had, they didn't have really any alternatives for the environmental community. Um, we were starting to see what we are seeing more and more of now, which is we were losing our old growth forest to fire. Um, and we were losing the wildlife species and the diversity and the um, arrangement of wildlife. Uh, and water quality is out of whack. Now, there's a lot of reasons for all of those things, fire suppression being a huge one. Um, the Malheur has a <clears throat> very robust grazing program. Every acre of that forest is grazed, and that's a problem. So we've got that as an issue also. And the forest ha is, has always been a workhorse forest, um, which, which means that it has been heavily logged in the past. And on, in that landscape, we logged the high value trees, just like we do on the west side. On the east side, we logged out the ponderosa pine and the larch, which are very fire resistant trees. And so when you remove those and you suppress fire, what grows back is a bunch of grand fir, which is highly susceptible to wildfire and not very disease or drought resistant. Um, so we got a mess out there. And that was a recipe for losing the remaining old growth that was in very, very, and remains in very short supply. So we needed to do something. Um, and on the dry side, again, because we don't have owls or merillettes, it's a little easier uh, to, to implement mechanical treatments than it is on the west side. So again, we were kind of lucky. And, and don't get me wrong, I do, I do all kinds of litigation on the west side. I'm, I'm all about spotted owls. <laughs> I'm all spotted owls all the time, but um, it's different on the east side and the ecology is different and the, the disturbance regimes are different. And it was really out of whack. And the scientists were telling us that. When people like Dr. Norm Johnson and Dr. Jerry Franklin come and tell you that your forest is a mess and that you need to remove some of the small diameter trees in order to save the old growth, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to listen to that. So there was a reason for us to come together. Okay, okay, great, great. Okay, I'm talking through Lori's, otherwise, we have echoes. Sorry about that. <laughs> So great, um, uh, thanks, Susan Jane. And, uh, there's a that leads into a very pertinent question from the chat from uh, Kathy Conway and Alan Jornet um, about best available science and how you come to agree on what is the best available science uh, with, from from different perspectives. Yeah, we did a lot. Of, we 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 do a lot with science. Um, we. Um, so how do we decide on best available science? That is a good question. Um, we talked to a lot of scientists and um, we put them through their paces. We take them out into the field and we say, okay, you tell us what you think is going on here and explain to us what's happening. Um, and we listen to them talk to each other and debate those ideas back and forth. And so for us, it is a combination of um, peer reviewed literature, listening to people we respect that make good sense, that 
will come out into the field and talk to us on our turf about what we're looking at right here in front of us, you know, what's going on in the stand. Um, monitoring and adaptive management. We do a lot of monitoring um, on the mall here, and that's largely due to our Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Act funding. Uh, we put 10% of that money towards monitoring every year. So we've been monitoring our work for about eight years now. And what we've learned is that what we are doing is working. We are reducing uh, stand composition. We're shifting species composition to be more larch and pine than grand fir, which is what historically would have been there and is sustainable. It's what the climate experts tell us is gonna be sustainable in the future. Um, and so we, we act and we monitor and we adapt and we talk to people. Um, and there's not universal agreement. We know that there is disagreement in the literature and we're honest about that. And we recognize that there is a difference of opinion, but we can weigh the evidence. Um, you know, in law, this is where I get to put on my, my lawyer hat in law, when juries are evaluating a piece of evidence and deciding what kind of weight to give a piece of evidence or judges, judges or juries. They consider a variety of things, particularly around science. So if a scientific method is being discussed in like patent law, for example, or healthcare law, you're gonna look at the studies that look at that process or look at that uh, treatment. Are those studies replicable? Is the process, is the method that's used accepted in the broader scientific community? What do other scientists say about it? So you, you evaluate the weight of evidence using a fairly standard set of principles. And we do the same thing with forestry science as well. And so for us, the best available science is stuff that we've put through its paces and we're fairly certain is accurate because we've tested it ourselves. Now that's a pretty, um, that's a luxury that we've had the ability to monitor and to adapt and to implement and study because that doesn't happen all the time. But it does give us a high degree of confidence that what we're doing is right. Okay. You have to go, I don't see any. Um, okay, uh, it sounds like um, Alan had, wants to talk a little bit more on this. Do you, you want to say it, Lark? Because I didn't see it. Oh, okay. So this is our you. first time trying to uh, collaborate here on things. So I'm going to unmute Alan uh, because he wanted to explain the basis of his query. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, and and I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Susan. Um, by the way, before I go on, I should say I've, I've been um, a, a big fan of yours for a long time, particularly with, in relation to your work with the, uh, the whole Jordan Cove huh. debacle. Um, yep. and so hopefully we're done with so that. I, hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, fingers crossed. So I just want to say I'm, I am not being confrontational. I'm trying not to. But, but this, this thing about deciding what constitutes the best available science is turning out to be a, a, a big problem, uh, as, as you will undoubtedly appreciate. And I, I understand when you're talking about Jerry Franklin and Norm Johnson. I, I'm totally, I totally get you. But the, the difficulty that we have, and it, it, it's kind of weird because it, this deciding what constitutes the best available science doesn't just turn up in the disagreement between, if you like, the climate activists and the timber industry, if you want to put it that way, mm -hmm. but it turns up in, within the climate movement. Yes. And, and so in the arena of, um, of what we're talking about, the, uh, the whole idea that of um, fire suppression, the invasion of lots of small trees, et cetera, which you were alluding to. Of course, there are some folks in the scientific arena who reject that discussion. 
Mm-hmm. And so we, we we certainly get into a problem, a situation where there's there is, and I will grant you, what you're articulating is the um, what I would call the majority opinion. It might even it's not quite consensus, but it's the majority opinion. But there is then the the other school of thought which says no, that's not what's happening, and that whole idea about thinning the forest is is crap. Mm-hmm. And so and they're, they're both appealing to their science and that you know yeah I've, I've spent a lot of time in forestry issues and i i have a problem because i know that the the majority opinion isn't always right <laughs> been oh. there i know <laughs> okay yeah yeah no i i i don't disagree with anything that you said there, Al. Um, yeah, I. I mean, here, here's, here's the other thing too that I think is also relevant to climate action and this question of science and like where it all fits in and stuff. Um, we're not going to have perfect knowledge. I mean, it would be great if we had if we were omniscient and we knew everything, right? We're not going to have perfect knowledge, so based on what we do know, do we know enough to take action? And for climate change, I think that we know enough to take certain actions that we can talk about in a way that doesn't have to focus on, this is anthropogenic climate change and we should stop driving our cars, for example. You know, that that kind of mantra tends to trigger the sort of naysayer side of the climate argument because everyone wants to drive their pickup trucks. Um, And I think when it comes to forest management, the other thing to keep in mind is that the scope of the uh, land mass that we're talking about is huge. Um, And we aren't going to be able to treat all of it, even if we could but we can't. And so we're not going to. And so I think the question is, where do you focus your efforts? So not everybody is going to get everything they want. And I think that's honestly where, when it comes to forest management, the debate is right now is where are we going to focus our limited capacity, human money? Where are we going to do that? And I think you know, yes, you can, you can appeal, to, you can find any science you want to give you any answer that you desire. Um, but I think it also, again, goes back to the weight of the evidence. And I honestly don't get to actually make that decision at the end of the day, right? The Forest Service gets to make the decision about whether or not to implement a project. I can be as persuasive as I can try to be, and hopefully I would influence them in my way, I am a lawyer, I do try to be persuasive. Um, But I also recognize that I'm not always gonna get my way. And that's just sort of the facts of the matter. I again think that the work that we're doing on the Malheur is the right thing to do. I do think that the prevailing evidence suggests that our approach is the right one. But I'm willing to acknowledge I'm not 100% sure about that. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Um, we're still not going to restore the entire Malheur National Forest. So if I am wrong, there are going to be parts of it that I didn't get my paws on. I think that um, I'd like to uh, flip to another question now from Rose Gerstner. She's uh, understanding the the, your intro where people were. Mm -hmm. And John Day were very, very poor and they depended on the forest and, and all of that. Um, and she's at, making the link to what her experience in West Virginia. Were, were, and she's asking the question, were people, were local people the investors or were, mm-hmm. were was in fact, you know, investors from far away, from Wall Street, from yep. other kinds of places? Yeah, um, good question. Um, we've seen a lot of that in the media lately this year, haven't we? Um, in, uh, in John Day, the mill is owned by John Shelk. Um, he uh, is a fourth generation Oregonian. 
He lives in Prineville. Um, he is not a Wall Street guy. <laughs> um, he is very passionate about his community and his business. But no, he's he's a local guy. Um, and I'll and I'll tell you a little secret about John. I won't spill all of the tea, but I will tell you one secret about John. Um, John's a great guy and um, older gentleman reminds me of my grandfather. So I automatically have a bunch of respect for him, even though we've disagreed on things over the years. Um, when his mill was going to close and the collaborative worked together to, to keep the mill open, um, he, he really at that point embraced collaboration. He's like, yep, this is the way to do things. Um, the old way of fighting is not working and I'm going to go all in for this collaborative stuff and has been a vocal proponent of our work since then. To his detriment, um, the blowback that he received from his colleagues in the timber industry was intense and remains that way to the point where he resigned his membership in the American Forest Resources Council, which AFRC, that's the Timber Industry Trade Association group that represents everybody, except for John Shelk. <sighs> Um, and so he, he's, he's one of a kind. Um, so not one of those, um, big corporate, um, timber owners. Um, but I, I appreciate the question and it's a good one, um, for sure. Um, and I'm looking at Rose's other question. Um, do our taxes pay for logging on public lands? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, your taxes that you send to the U.S. Treasury do turn around and are appropriated to all federal agencies, including the Forest Service and the BLM, to conduct all kinds of things, including logging on public lands. And that's because those public lands are multiple use lands. And that includes multiple uses like logging, like wilderness, like recreation. Um, they are lands of many uses. And so, yes, your tax dollars do go um, to support logging on public lands. Uh, Susan Flavia has a question a little bit lower down about whether this, uh, whether this whole partnership improved the reputation of the Forest Service among the parties. Um, yes. Um, yes, we... Reputation is, is probably not the right word. Um, I think that we are, in the words of my good friend, Mark Webb, we are more charitable towards the Forest Service because we much better understand what they deal with and what they go through on a regular basis because we spend so much time in partnership with them. So we hear about their struggles. We hear about why they make some of the crazy, dumb decisions that they do that sometimes you're like, why are you making that decision? And now, because we're friendly, we can ask, why did you make that dumb decision? They're like, oh, let me tell you about the crazy thing that we had to do, and this is where we ended up with this dumb decision. And so you get to understand a little bit more about how the world really works. And it works you know, across the board. Um, when the Forest Service is like, hey, this new Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision came down that everyone is all crazy about. And I don't understand what it means. What does it mean? I'm like, oh, well, let me tell you what it means. <laughs> and so that sort of, you know, peer learning and sharing of information is super helpful. And so our partners have a much better understanding of what is going on with the agency and how it works. Um, that doesn't mean that we always like what they do. In fact, we don't like what they do a lot of the time, um, but we can help them out sometimes, you know, when you actually know what's going on and what the real problem is, it's like, oh, that's the problem. Well, let's work together to find a solution to that problem because that's a problem we can fix. So there's a lot more sort of joint problem solving and understanding around what is going on that is, is amazing and very helpful. Um, we still really struggle with our Forest Service partners, though. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, but we can have a beer with them at the end of the day. And that's progress. Great. So I, I've got a question now from me. It's not in the chat. Um, and I'm just picking up on your comment that it was super lucky that you had the right people at the right place at the right time 
if the right reasons to, to actually do something together. Uh, super lucky. And how often does that happen? All you know, all those planets becoming aligned. So my question is, what about this experience that changes the way you were looking to create your own lucky moments like that? Because you can't, we can't just leave it to luck. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think this experience, um, which um, has just sort of colored the way that um, I try to operate in the world writ large, um, whether it's my litigation work or my policy work um, or other collaborative efforts. Um, you know, I try to be alert for kind of that diamond in the rough, you know, look for those people, those individuals that, you know, have something about them that, you know, it's like, yeah, I, that's, I, that's interesting. Maybe I'd like to work with that person or, you know, the, the networking, being able to put people together to solve problems, um, which is a collaborative approach to problem solving. That's something that um, has really seeped into my daily practice in life, whether it's litigation or policy or, or collaboration. Um, and so I'm just more aware, I think, of um, the, the opportunities that present themselves to work together. Um, which again, you know, I'm still an attorney. I, you know, I filed a lawsuit yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to file one next week too. So like, I still believe in the adversarial system. Um, but litigation is not always the right tool. Uh, litigation is a great tool for stopping bad things from happening. It is a terrible tool to encourage good things to happen. And so you kind of got to look for what, you know, what tool does this situation demand? Um, and having people that have different experiences bring those different tools. So I'm looking for folks that have different perspectives, that have done different things, that approach things in different ways, even if I don't understand it fully or even agree with it. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking for those, those folks and, and the opportunity to, to do something. Um, whether it's a big thing or a little thing, I think there's, we can always, we can all be looking for those situations to present themselves where, you know, it's like, I can make, I can fix this. Why don't you and I go do this thing together? Or why don't we call that person and help that person out or whatever it is. Um, I think just being more sensitive and open to those opportunities is something that, that this work has really taught me because as a, as a litigator, you don't really, you're not taught that. <laughs> I mean, you're taught to understand both sides of the argument, but you're not taught to understand both parties, right? And so I don't think a lot of lawyers approach their litigation practice that way. And again, don't get me wrong, I still sue people, but um, it's not always the right tool. It's not always the right tool. Okay, well, if anybody has any more questions, um, this would be the time to ask them. Raise or raise your hand if you wanna chime mm -hmm. in. <laughs> okay, well, I think we've wrapped it up on questions then. I wanna be respectful of your time and everyone's time. Um, this has been really interesting and my, my mind is expanded and I'm you know, I, I trying to have new thoughts. Oh, I have a question. My partner has another question. Sorry, sorry to, sorry to, to interject again, but I do have another question that I wrote down as I was listening, listening right at the beginning. This has happened over a very long period of time. And uh, you talked about the three years that it took for forming. So that triggered in my mind this question about, you know, how do you keep people together, the same people together, or you can't always keep the same people together, you're bringing in new people. How do you, what's the process that you, that you use to actually uh, incorporate new people and speak that same language? Yeah, you know, early on it was, it was pretty easy because it was so slow. Um, you know, you kind of, you gotta go slow to go fast. And so we weren't rushing anything and we would have, meetings. Um, we currently meet every month for three days. 
<laughs> which is crazy town. Um, but we originally met, you know, every couple of months for a day or for a couple hours, maybe we'd do a field trip. So it would be an all day thing. Um, so early on, it was a fairly slow process um, to kind of bring people in. And it's definitely not for everybody. And so we kind of at, at one at some point along the line reached an equilibrium of people that were interested, engaged, wanted to be there and thought it had merit or had a chance. You know, so again, there was some sorting. People came and went and folks that thought, you know, I'm going to give this a shot, decided to stick around. And again, I think it was because all the sides had reason to try. Um, we were all worried about losing something. Mm -hmm. And so there was reason for people to stick around. So, you know, I think that's, that's, does that answer your question, Bob? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Uh, there's another question. There's uh, Mary Scott has her hand up and then there's another question from Linda. So Mary, you can go ahead and ask your question first and then we'll read Linda's question. Hi, um, thank you very much. I I can't help but ask how the last five years, especially, has clouded the work. Um, you know, I've admired what you've been doing for a long time and I use it as inspiration, but I feel we're in a very different place now. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so yeah, the last four years were a little rough. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think that the inspiration is you got to keep your eye on the prize. I mean, do you believe in what you believe in? Um, I believe in what I believe in. I believe that I'm doing the right thing. Um, I also know that I'm not going to see the fruits of my labor because I'm talking about trees and forests that, you know, are going to persist past my lifetime. So I hope, you know, to the earlier conversation, I hope I have made the right decisions that my decisions and those of my compatriots mean that in 150 years, that forest is more sustainable and can receive fire on a regular basis and not lose the old growth and not burn up, you know, John Day. Um, so you, you got to keep your eyes on the prize, um, endless pressure, endlessly applied. And I think it's about also recognizing the the little victories that you definitely don't know that you are having when you're in it but looking backwards it's like oh my god look what we did i mean when the mill announced they were going to close that was that was going to that was bad that was super duper bad and we came out on the other side better stronger and but during when we were in it it was bad news um you know a couple of years ago in what was it, 2016, <laughs> had a bad fire year. Canyon Creek fire came roaring out of the middle of nowhere and almost burned up John Day and Prairie City and Canyon City. And I was like, you mean after all this restoration work and all of this agreement, we have the one thing that we knew we were gonna have, which was a fire, and it just burned up everything. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> what are we gonna do? Turns out fire burned up a lot. It's true, um, did a lot of good, did a lot of good. And we learned a lot from it. We actually collaborated on some post-fire management, um, which still gives me the shivers. Um, <laughs> I don't like it, um, but you know, out of adversity comes success. I really do believe that because I've felt it and I've experienced it myself. And so, you know, keeping your eye on the prize and celebrating those small victories and the big ones too, I think is really important because it is about all of the little things um, adding up to be the big thing. And it is, it's all of our little efforts that together we're stronger and we're better and we can make a difference if we work together, which is super cheesy and really trite, but it's also true. So that, that's actually an answer to, uh, in part, to, to Linda Peterson Adams' question. Um, how do you deal with the people who say there isn't anything that individuals can do to make changes? So you've answered it partially. Do you want to say anything else about that, though? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I 
I know that it can be really daunting and depressing um, and really challenging. I mean, I, you know, to, to share sort of my songs of depression and woe, you know, I look at the, the fires in California um, and Southern Oregon, and I really wonder, you know, are we going to even have intact old growth left when I'm 75 or 85? We're, we're burning a lot of it up and I'm really scared. I'm really worried. Um, but I also know that there are a lot of people like me who are doing this kind of work in places um, like John Day or like Ashland or, you know, any of the other places where this work happens. And we're making a difference. It's slow. We didn't get here overnight either. So we can't expect quick solutions because we didn't get here overnight. But it's hard. Patience, man. Patience is tough. <laughs> I, I, I don't always take my patient's pill and it's frustrating. Well, we're, we're all human. Um, well, thank you. Um, I guess um, I, I think I might uh, wrap up as the questions are, we've got a lot of thank yous in the chat, but um, my friend um, Flavia says that she got this saying from a friend, you might think of sustainability as extending the golden rule through time so that you do unto future generations, as well as your present human beings, as you would have them do unto you. That is from Robert Gilman, the director of the Context Institute. Yeah, nice. And lastly, um, from Kathy and Alan, using this information as we approach issues in our area will be a challenge, they say. It is going to be helpful to have a variety of people with different skills join these efforts. For sure. Yeah. Takes a village. It does. Well, Susan Jane, thank you so much for spending your evening with us. It was You're really welcome. wonderful to hear you share your experiences. And I, I know you have a lot of work to do still left this <laughs> evening. So. Um, so thank you and thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to my Ashland Climate Action colleagues, uh, Louise Shortcat and uh, Linda Peterson Adams, Joanne Eggers, Kathy Conway. Thank you to my husband, Bob, for, for helping me uh, with the chat. Um, and um, our next programs, uh, September 22nd, uh, our partner Electrify Now will have a program on methane gas that we're promoting. Uh, they do excellent work. Um, around electrification and climate change. So we will send that out to you and hopefully you'll be able to join that. Um, and then in, uh, there's several more Electrify Now programs in October, which we'll, we'll be promoting. And then at the end of October, we're joining hands with the SOCAN monthly meeting uh, for program on community solar uh, uh, opportunities in Ashland, as well as in um, other parts of the Rogue Valley with Solarize Rogue. So. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, please look out for the evaluation form, which I'll sh also share with Susan Jane. Um, so, and um, look out for our upcoming programs. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And Susan Jane, if you could just hang on for just a second. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. <laughs>